Coming up on the DMT One to One Show, episode 78, on the 18th of November 2014, an interview with Simon Cole, the CEO of Seven Digital. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT 121 show and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome Simon Cole, the CEO of 7 Digital. So hi Simon and thanks for joining me today. How's it going? No problem. Thanks, Andrea. It's going great. Thank you. It's uh, great to have you. And 7 Digital is a technology company with music at its core. And uh, uh, many of you will be familiar that listen to Digital Music Trends uh, uh, you know, with the company itself. Uh, but uh, it has undergone a number of changes over the past uh, sort of uh, 6 uh, to 12 months. Uh, and especially uh, there's been this uh, reverse takeover uh, by uh, UBC Media that uh, has created this new entity, uh, 7 Digital, uh, uh, the 7 Digital Group uh, PLC, which is uh, uh, on on the stock market uh, here in the UK, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about uh, uh, where the company is going next. So Simon, first of all, uh, I, th- I guess it's fair to say that when I heard about reverse takeover, I had to go and look up what it was. And then you're going to uh, ask me what a reverse takeover is. Well, not, not exactly, but sort of, <laughs> you know, I, I think for, first thing first, I wanted to ask you about how, uh, when did, did the talks with 7Digital start uh, around this? Uh, you were CEO of uh, UBC uh, Media uh, at the time. And uh, how did those talks evolve uh, to create this this uh, uh, particular deal that, that happened uh, in May? Well, the evolution of this deal goes back actually about eight years, almost to the, um, the beginnings of 7Digital. Uh, at that time, UBC Media, which has been a company operating in the radio industry, was doing some pioneering work in uh, digital radio, DAB digital radio here in the UK, which is our terrestrial uh, digital transmission standard. And we were working on a system which would allow people to buy music while they were listening to a digital radio. It involved sending metadata over the digital radio stream to a device which then was connected via IP and allowed people to purchase the songs. Um, It was way ahead of its time, uh, but actually our provider of music, uh, our library provider, was Ben. He'd just set up a 7Digital and we met up with him and we did a deal for him to become our music supplier. So I met Ben all the way back then and we kept in touch um, throughout the period. Now, during that period, there's been a lot of transition in both of our industries. The the music service we were talking about, in the end, um, we gave up. Frankly, we gave up on trying to persuade the radio industry that it was a good idea to sell people songs, something which I think other people are now doing for them, sadly. But um, we we moved on to other things, and a company called Imagination Technologies took over that technology that we'd uh, innovated and, in fact, became a shareholder in UBC. At the same time, 7Digital moved on, moved from uh, doing download stores to beginning to do streaming services. We at UBC moved into streaming radio. Uh, We were the designers of a piece of software, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Andrea, called the Radio Player, which is how most people in the UK listen to online radio. And it's responsible for the UK being the fastest growing market in the world for online listening to radio. So we began, in short, to do lots of work in streaming radio. Yeah. And then about a year ago, Hussain uh, Yasai, who's the boss of Imagination Technologies, who were also a shareholder in 7Digital, he and I were having a discussion um, about strategic futures. And we started talking about 7Digital and UBC. And the more we talked about it, the more it became plain to me that actually these two companies were kind of moving into a space which was a very interesting space, which was somewhere between traditional linear radio and traditional music downloading, which was the new streaming market where there are services which are, you know, some of them radio-like, some of them streaming-like. Um, so I sat down and talked to Ben, uh, you know, and to cut a long story short, we decided to put the two companies together. And let's not use the phrase reverse takeover again. It's a technical phrase. Uh, uh, God knows what it even said when you looked it up. <laughs> this is a merger of two companies. It's a, it, Intellectually, it's a merger of two companies. And Intellectually, the important thing is it's a merger of a company with massive uh, experience in digital music, 7Digital, and a company with massive experience in online and digital radio and the radio industry generally, globally, uh, UBC, to create a new company which has a toolkit of products which can offer to build services for people, whether they are you know, a customer like, and yesterday we announced a deal with RTE, the Irish broadcaster, to build some online uh, tools for them uh, and the Irish radio industry. So whether it's yeah. right at that end, whether it's right at the other end in terms of just building a streaming music service or a download store, great. 
But the really interesting stuff, and what, what I have to say is most of our sales pipeline at the moment, is in the middle. It's things right. like the Will I Am service, the service we just did for SBS, what we're doing for Onkyo, uh, what we're doing for Rock in the US, what we're doing for Guevara in India. These are services which are genuinely in the halfway house between a streamed radio service and a streamed music service. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, I'm very excited about the convergence of these two spaces. Uh, you know, f uh, up until now, really, we've seen a, still a quite a bit of separation between the two. Uh, uh, one of the first moves that we've seen uh, from a mainstream perspective uh, has been, the, for example, the acquisition of Stitcher by Deezer, which happened a couple yes. of weeks ago. And, and that's sort of... Uh, that's in exactly the right space, same space, yes. Exactly. And so uh, from your perspective, you know, uh, UBC Media obviously had a, a lot of experience also in producing uh, programs. Uh, uh, I'm excited about the convergence between, uh, you know, for example, talk radio that has some more, mm. uh, you know, personalized content uh, and uh, uh, on, you know, on demand, but also personalized services on the music front. You know, do you think that these are areas that are relatively mm. unexplored? still? there's still a lot to do. On, on the, on there's, the there's a lot to do. I mean, we are definitely in um, a very nascent um, market. And talking about that speech content, I completely agree with you. And of course, one of the other assets that UBC brought to this deal was its shareholding in a company called Audio Boom, yeah. which has now been renamed Audio Boom. And we, in fact, virtually founded that company together with Channel 4 five years ago and have seen it through its incubation period and its development into a very sophisticated technology. And Audio Boom, of course, does, and I would say this, wouldn't I? It, would, it does what Stitcher does, but better. Um, and Audio Boom is part of um, the infrastructure that is necessary for this new world, which is why we decided to retain our shareholding in it but we decided to give it its, a separate listing as a company because it sure. needed to grow and develop in a very different way. Audio Boom is the direct-to-consumer service, which is you know, fast, fast growing in the social media space. Seven Digital is a very different business model. So what we did when we merged Seven Digital and UBC, as if we didn't have enough to do, we decided to do a second reverse takeover at the same time, yeah. and we reversed Audio Boom into a cash shell it now has its own listing, as I'm sure you and many of your uh, viewers will know. Uh, you know, the shares are up nearly 700% since we listed. So that's been a terrific success. And in fact, we sold a small part of our shareholding in it uh, three weeks ago for 3.6 million. And our total wow. investment in Audio Boom for our whole shareholding was 1.8 million. Um, so, you know, Not we count ourselves as, as being fortunate. But we are working with Audio Boom, uh, and I sit on the board of Audio Boom, on some interesting services which you'll hear more about in the coming weeks where we are taking speech content uh, with music and creating services where you might want to listen to an artist as well as listen to some of their music. Yep. And I think if you look at this converged space, to imagine that it's going to be as simple as people pushing a button and getting lists of records would be <laughs> you know, ridiculous. Um, the market that is emerging is the market that will replace or at least enhance what is currently the linear radio market which is the way most people consume their music and always has been yeah that is the thing that's going digital and that is the very interesting space and Absolutely. of course, that will involve speech content as well. Yeah, and I, I would actually uh, point out that the show, this show, is also on Audio Boom. So if uh, uh, Audio Boom, so if anybody hasn't tried that, that service yet, they can actually go, uh, head on to uh, is audioboom.com now. Audioboom.com, yes, Perfect. or audioboo.com. They both still and work, you can, you or can, just go into the iTunes Store or the Android Play Store and uh, type in Audio Boom and download the brand new app. Uh, the apps have been Great. recently updated, and uh, then they can favorite digital music t trends and your content will come up as soon as they open their iPhone. Exactly, yeah, it's ingested automatically so uh, definitely uh, go and check it out if you haven't uh, uh, tried it before. It's always fun to try out new services and uh, and so uh, talking about the, you know, the technology element, uh, obviously you came, uh, you brought together two companies that probably had their own technical teams and they're on their own mm. solutions, their own APIs, their own uh, everything essentially. So how are you tackling this transition and how are you, are you making sure that, that there's a synergy between the two groups? Well, um, th that's a there's a complicated answer to that, um, and, and, <laughs> sure. and, and let me uh, because it's a complicated process. Because not only are we bringing together two different technical teams, we're bringing together two different cultures. Because one of the reasons that the radio industry and the music technology industry ha have not naturally drifted together, because in the consumer space they are naturally drifting together, but as industries they haven't, um, is that the cultures are completely different. Uh, you know, I'm. 
from the radio industry. I spent more than 30 years in the radio industry, the BBC, commercial radio, overseas radio uh, companies. Um, so I know that culture. Yeah. The digital music culture, which Ben uh, knows and everybody at 7 Digital, is completely different. So we're talking about merging two cultures. And the first thing we decided to do was not to rush it. To rush one thing, but not to rush a second thing. Yeah. The thing we rushed was putting everybody together. So within six weeks of getting the deal done, we had 120 staff sitting on one floor in Wilson Street wow. together. And, uh, and I know this is an old-fashioned thing to say because we all live in a supposedly virtual wor world where we can work at home and not come into an office, yeah. but I happen to believe that physical contact between human beings is something that you can't replace digitally. So we were very careful about the layout of the new office to the extent that we took the people who worked on the content side of UBC, the program producers, and we sat them in amongst the people at Seven Digital who dealt with the content side of the record companies. So people who were closer together in culture. We took the technology teams of UBC and sat them in the, the development areas where the software they were, they, they were working on was more common. Yeah. And we thought, well, we'll do that a bit like throwing seeds in a flower bed, if you like. We'll do that and then we'll just see what happened. And one of the most encouraging things about this whole deal is that what happened very quickly was that the two sets of people got very enthusiastic about the opportunity. And it would be no exaggeration to say that the enthusiasm of the staff, certainly the, the uh, UBC staff with the radio industry experience, their, exper their, their enthusiasm for this new world is, if you like something, I'm having to slow down. I mean, literally today <laughs> I sent an email to one of our production staff who was gurgling with ideas about streaming music services i said okay matt you know terrific love your enthusiasm but let's just calm down because we need to do things at a pace yeah i think some of the people who have come over from ubc and have spent their life making radio programs or working in the technology sector in radio see this as a massive opportunity for growth which frankly they had they had not seen uh, where they were before um, there are aspects of the radio industry that are not growing. Uh, there are very much emerging two types of companies in the radio sector, those who want to see a different future and those who want to try and perpetuate the current model. Yeah. And I'm afraid the second category of those is going only one place. And, you know, we all, those of us that have seen digital transa transition know where that is. But there are companies, Global Radio here in the UK, Southern Cross Stereo, iHeart Radio in the States, um, Astro in Malaysia. There are visionary radio companies who are doing things in this new in this new space. Yeah. But we we can't rush it. You know, <laughs> you're dealing with moving massive cultures, and equally, you're dealing with moving um, consumers. You know, seventy percent of people who listen to the radio don't have a digital music service and don't stream their radio. Yeah. So that is both an opportunity and a problem. It's an opportunity because it's a mass. It's it's the bit of the market that actually yeah. will be the bit that will be the most interesting. But it's going to be the most challenging because those people clearly don't want to pay nine ninety nine to Spotify to build their own playlists. Sure, they are what we call the entertain me button customers. They want to hit a button and get something that they want. That's what they've always done listening to the radio. Now they will do that in the digital music world and the digital content world in new ways and we've got to gradually work out what those ways are and work with our customers to develop those kind of products. Yeah, and it must be interesting to be in the middle of all that because essentially you can observe what's happening in, in the space and, and really uh, uh, get a feel for uh, where the, the, whole, the whole industry is going. It's fascinating. I mean, our sales pipeline at the moment is a totally fascinating uh, place. You know, and just look at the deals we've, we've done recently, you yeah. know, the deal with um, Spanish broadcasting services in, in the US. Now, I can't tell you because they won't let me exactly what digital services we're developing for them. But clearly, they're a linear radio company. They want music services that complement their linear uh, radio uh, services. And there are some very exciting things uh, coming out of that. Uh, Rock Mobile, which is the the service in the states, it uh, comes with comes with music SIM card, and the way that works is you power it up and it offers you a radio station straight away, right. and then it learns what you like and it offers you more radio stations, or you can go in and you can pick tracks, so you can do whatever you like, but it will straight away give you what you want, um, and 
most of our sales pipeline is made up of people who want services like that, who want services that are what what we call lean back services. Sure. In other words, you know, you just you open it up and something happens, yeah. and then you choose whether you like it or not. Uh, you know, and Pandora, of course, in consumer services globally, Pandora has demonstrated this model um, very powerfully. Yeah, and for you, it must have been a, a pretty interesting uh, sort of learning curve in the last 12 months as well, because uh, uh, obviously you talked about how the, these are two different worlds, and there's so much going on in the music streaming space that, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe even as a, as a business model perspective, you might have had to get your head around. Uh, uh, there's been an awful lot. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things about this, the last six months, um, which I didn't anticipate is, uh, you know, I've never worked harder in my life, frankly, but... It's the kind of hard work where you get out of bed in the morning with a spring in your step. Now, I'll be honest with you, 18 months ago, working purely in the radio industry with the UBC, I wasn't getting out of bed with a spring in my step. I was getting out of bed with Groundhog Day, you know, going around the same things. Uh, now, you get out of bed with a bunch of challenges. But, boy, you have a, you know, you have a busy day uh, dealing with them all. But I would certainly prefer life uh, to be like that. But the most important thing for me to learn quickly in this new job is to learn what i need to learn yeah you know and that is about the technology world about the music industry i've had a massive i mean obviously i know you know the music industry course, is part yeah. of the radio industry but there again you see the radio industry's attitude to the music industry is completely different from the digital music industry's attitude yeah. <laughs> to the music industry look at taylor swift and spotify you know the one thing about the radio industry is it's been friends with the music industry in most countries in the world i might except the US in this statement, but in most countries in the world, it's been friends with the music industry for 70 years because it's been helping them sell their, sell their product. So there's been a collaborative uh, working relationship there. So there are some bits of the digital music space where collaboration is, is definitely not going on. Yeah, and there's still differences need, between the two spaces. I need to learn why that is. And, and uh, you know, we need to work with both sides of that equation to, to, to make sure that it, that it is collaborative. So, yeah, there's, there's an immense amount for me to learn still, and there has been an immense amount to learn in the last six months. And, uh, you know, I remember a couple of years ago when I spoke to uh, Vicky Norman uh, uh, back in uh, at South by Southwest when she was the president of uh, North America for Seven Digital. And we were talking about uh, how important it was for the company to expand into the field of startups and sort of provide interesting licensing opportunities for companies that wanted to experiment with the business models, uh, but uh, didn't have well, obviously the, the resources to go and make the deals directly themselves. So how mm. are you seeing, you know, we've seen the deal with the, with the Will I Am uh, uh, watch uh, a company that's uh, going to come up in a, in a few months time and uh, how do you see that portion of the business evolving in terms of uh, uh, helping out companies that uh, you know people that have great ideas but mm. but need that back end in order to to make them uh, uh, viable and and uh, and uh, practical well i love the fact that your startup example is will i am i think there are a lot of startups that would love to be uh, yeah, exactly. will i am I and mean, He's in a slightly different category from most other startups but you make a you make a, a good point and a, and a serious point and, and it is a challenge for us. At the one end of the spectrum, we have to make ourselves available to people who've got a, you know, a cardboard box and a great idea and want to build a music service. And we have to give them an API which allows them entry to the market. And we've got to persuade the music industry that we have to let those people have hold of something so they can experiment with. And we've, we've got ways of doing that. On the other hand, we can't expend enormous amounts of our time and resource on those people because we have to create a tool that lets them help themselves otherwise we'd be tangled up with that at the other end of the spectrum the customers we really want to identify and spend a lot of our time on are people like will i am who are very well resourced who whilst they're a startup they're a startup with an enormous amount of experience you know chandra who's the uh, who's will's uh, chief executive of his business was from intel and you know knows the technology space very well um so it's a very well resourced company both intellectually and financially and i think yeah. when people see some of will's investors there are going to be some significant eyes raised as to the people who are putting money into that venture um, and that will probably be in the last week in november when that kind of thing will be talked about but you know working with them has been an absolute joy for us because it's allowed us to show ourselves at the be at the best i mean if i tell you that within six weeks from a standing start we created uh, a fully curated set of streamed music services 
and a fitness app and we licensed we had in principle licensing agreements with every label and the independents um i'm incredibly proud of the team we have and i believe there is no other company in the world that could have got that done as quickly as we did technically uh, from a, and from a licensing point of view yeah. so you know your point about having the licenses and having the ability to quickly get the majors to tick the box on new services is is vital to us we have to get the trust of the majors that they have yeah. to know that we're not going <laughs> sure. to just license to some you know a guy who's going to let people pirate songs i mean there's a responsible position that we occupy here but i think it's an important position because the exciting thing about the future of the music industry notwithstanding you know some of taylor swift's you know more more aggressive accusations in the last few days the exciting thing is that this world of streaming music is going to make music and revenue from music available in places where it has never been available yeah. now whether that means you get 5p or 2p or half a p per play the most important thing to concentrate on is that you're going to get thousands and thousands of times more plays than you ever did yeah i have two stepsons 17 and 14 they consume more music than i could ever have dreamed of when i was their age and one way or another they pay for it it might be an ad supported service it might be the fact that their stepdad pays for their spotify account it might be the fact that they buy a you know a set of wireless speakers that comes with music for two years etc cetera, etc cetera. it's just an enormous marketplace and for the music industry this could well be a golden age the next five years driven by all of these new comes with music services yeah and yeah. will's will's uh, pulse device is just an example of that you sure. know i can't go into the exact business model because that's being announced on the 28th but this isn't going to be something that you go online and subscribe to this is going to be something that you buy the device you buy your sim you get your sim card you get your deal from at&t and telefonica and you've got your music yeah you know end of story nobody's going to say so how much was that music cost you know it it just came with it but the record companies are doing very nicely out of it it's yeah. a great service, and the economic model for them is fantastic. It's not the same model as somebody going into, you know, Tower Records and buying a nine ninety nine album. Of course, it's not. Yeah. But you know, I drive a car, which is not quite the same as a car with wooden wheels was fifty years ago. <laughs> so the guys who made the wooden wheels, you know, yeah. it's been a bad fifty years for them, but it's been okay for Dunlop. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a difficult. Uh, I think that the next couple of years are going to be difficult because uh, we know that the. Uh, downwards a spiral of downloads is not quite yet being, being balanced off by the revenues coming from streaming but that's something that's going to change as a company scale but i mean spotify we've seen the revenues from spotify and and the uh, you know a company that can go from generating a billion for the industry between 2008 and 2013 and then making a, a billion just in the last 11 months yes it's just, well you, you know, saw what daniel said in his response to uh, the taylor swift controversy and I, I, you know i don't want to get into that i don't course, think yeah, any yeah. of us know you know what's going on between those two and it's cl clearly the relationship has not been great but let me just pick you up on one thing y you talked there about the move from a, a download to a stream this is not just a move of revenue coming from one place and moving to another and that's the most important thing to to understand this is a complete change of the business model yeah. so of course a stream or even a hundred thousand streams is not going to earn what the sale of a track did but the sale of a track was the end of the story when i went out you know when i was young and bought a you know as it happens vinyl records early on you know from woolworths and i took it home that's it you know yes i'd paid my whatever it was 49p for my single there's no more revenue from me for that i've got it for the rest of my life if i'm streaming that song on spotify Every time I stream it, there's a royalty play. So we're moving from a purchase model to a rental model. Yeah. And the economics will change completely. And you can't expect that in the first couple of years of the rental model, you're going to earn the same thing as you did in two years of a purchase model. Because in the purchase model, that was the end of your revenue. In the streaming model, it's the beginning of 10 years and i think one of the biggest opportunities for the record industry which which i don't see being um exploited uh, uh, as much as it could is back catalog 
there's a ma- anybody who programs radio stations knows that the massive demand from listeners is for what you call recurrence. Yeah. A recurrent is a song, and you'll have one. There'll be a song that, and I'm not a great program director, so I can't tell you what it is for you, Andrea, but, but there'll be a song from the last 10 years that if I played it to you now, you'd go, oh, my God, I'd forgotten that song existed. How amazing. Yeah. I now want to listen to it every day for the next two weeks. And you would be earning new revenue for the owners of that content, which they could never have dreamed of in the old world. Yeah. So the opportunity to create services which access back catalog is, I think, a phenomenal opportunity and is something that we're very focused on. Our, our content companies happen to produce lots of their heritage music programs for the biggest music network in the UK, BBC Radio 2. We produce Pick of the Pops and Sounds of the 60s. Yeah. And we know from those content teams that there are five million people who listen to those programs every Saturday who like heritage music. Absolutely. So, wow, let's offer them something that gives them that and the opportunity to stream it and have it curated, and then you will create a new revenue opportunity. And that, that's sort of, uh, I guess, one of the exciting parts of sitting the, the content guys from the two companies together, because I guess, uh, you know, the guys at 7 Digital that have been working on uh, sort of in, an integration of automatic uh, 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 curation processes and uh, uh, manual curation processes now have the opportunity to delve into some of the well, back catalog yeah. of curation that you guys have done over the years. Go- going on right now, this week in our office, is some very important work, uh, which has been done by, uh, by joint teams in how we create what we're calling human algorithms, which is an algorithmic curation service, but with human input. Yeah. And I'll give you one example of, of how important that is. And, and one example of something that a technical algorithm can never do, but a human being can do easily and can teach the machine how to do it. Um, every great program director in the world knows that in The Breakfast Show, the song you come out of the 8 o'clock news with is probably the most important song you'll play of the day because it has to be a song that catches people's attention, makes them feel good, and that will keep them locked on your radio station probably for the rest of the day. On the other hand, if you play a lousy song out of the 8 o'clock news, they go to another station and they stay there for the rest of the day. So that's what you would call a landing song. Now, which algorithm do you know that when you when you ask it to form a playlist, thinks of a landing song as the first one it plays you. It doesn't do that because algorithms don't know what a landing song is. You know, if you're looking for 80s music, then Can You Feel the Force from the Jacksons would be a great song. But that's just because you have to listen to it and as a human being go, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's it. So what you can do is you can take a, 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 a list of songs that an algorithm is picking from and you can get a human being to go, okay, well, here's, here are these 250 songs, but actually of these 250, here are the five songs that every, every time somebody starts a new playlist, you want to start it with one of those yeah. songs. Because that will just make people feel good, which is just an emotional thing, nothing to do with technology. And that's a small example of how you, know, you can integrate the human curation uh, thing with the, with the mechanical thing. The human thing gives you the quality, the technical ability gives you the scale. Absolutely. And, and Simon, I, I wanted to, you know, uh, end by asking you uh, something that I don't get to ask a lot of my guests because uh, uh, almost none of the companies, even the bigger ones that I talk to, are actually on the stock market. Uh, so, you know, of course, you are no stranger to the weird and wonderful behavior of the stock market where, <laughs> uh, when it comes to reacting to news. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, for example, you know, uh, the, the, the stock uh, had, uh, had a hit when BlackBerry announced it would shut down the music store yeah. and then had a massive uh, uh, jump when uh, you announced uh, the Will I Am uh, tie up. And so uh, UBC, uh, of course, has been a public company for uh, over a decade before uh, you uh, had the seven digital merger. So how do you deal with this uh, sort of uh, daily roller coaster of uh, sort of investors calling you up and, and the pressure that comes with that uh, to deliver a certain stock price or to, to deliver to investors in, in, that, in that sense? Well, yes, it's a roller coaster. If you run the company by looking at the roller coaster, then you're doing the wrong thing. Um, right. Uh, you don't run the company for each day's stock price. Equally, uh, you know, anybody that tells you they don't look at the stock price every day is, you know, is lying because you can't avoid it. People yeah, will sure. tell you what it is. But what you have to do is set out, especially in this uh, you know, very nascent industry that we're in, we have to set out some milestones for investors. We then have to achieve those milestones. 
Uh, and then at that point, I think you will get some mature recognition of what we're doing. Now, yeah. in terms of what we set out to do, we said we were going to create business to business services that combined radio and streaming music. We've already started to do that. The will, the, the, the um, bounce downwards from BlackBerry was an irrational response um, since we'd already told people that download stores would close. And in fact, specifically in our listing document, we said we expected the BlackBerry one would close. So you know, it was in our plans that it would close. In fact, we're actually earning slightly more out of BlackBerry in the next 18 months than we'd expected to at one stage um, because we're continuing to run a service for them. So that was an irrational response that way. And then the Will I Am thing was an irrational response the other, the other way because way, yeah, people exactly. didn't know what we were doing. You know, they didn't know whether it was a three month service or a 12 year service. Now, yeah. in the next couple of weeks, they will find out the details of that. All we can do is not be concerned about those irrational blips yeah. and the emotion that goes around it. We just have to steer a very determined course through the waters that we have identified. And I'm, I'm very confident that we're, we're doing that. I'm very confident that everything we set out when we put the company together is turning out to be true. And it's, it's, it's a very exciting time to be uh, at the company, I'm sure. It's, uh, it's been a roller coaster ride in the last uh, uh, six months since the merger. But uh, as, uh, as uh, you know, we, we talked about when setting up the interview, the, the, the dust is settling down now and, and yeah. you actually, uh, you know, you have a pretty clear plan of, of uh, what, what you're going to do in the next year or so. Which we is have a, a very clear plan and we have a sales pipeline with lots of customers who want that plan. And that's all you can want in business. And that's definitely exciting. Uh, well, Simon, uh, thanks so much for your time. It was a pleasure having oh. you on and, and a great to feature the company and uh, you know hear all that's been happening uh, over the last year or so uh, of course uh, uh, people that would like to know more can head on to 7digital.com and find out more about the company uh, especially the listeners in the US that might not be as familiar with actually the about about dot uh, seven digital.com is if right. you want to find out about the company seven digital.com will allow us to sell you some music which exactly. is terrific yeah. but which if you want to <laughs> discover uh, go to about dot seven digital.com and you'll find out more about the company uh, and uh, uh, Simon thanks so much for your time uh, keep in touch and let us know what's going Terrific. on uh, I'll in be the next checking year back so. with you Andrea and thanks for your interest it's much appreciated that's great and thanks so much for listening to the DMT one to one show where we cover some of the most exciting uh, companies uh, uh, including startups and established companies like in today's case uh, you can find it on digitalmusictrends.com and follow the links uh, to the one to one show or of course on YouTube and all the other audio channels where uh, DMT is distributed thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and uh, till next time if you enjoyed watching or listening to the show and would like to find more, head on to digitalmusictrends.com.